Greetings, everybody. It's Jim, and I'm here with Robert S. Conley, uh, the author of the Majestic Fantasy RPG. Now, what we're going to do here is uh, we've got a lot to talk about, but we are going to start this. Uh, you know, we're going to do this in a reverse method, and otherwise, in other words, we're just going to start talking about the book instead of the normal interview uh, way of doing small talk before we get there. I'm sure all of you want to know about Robert Conley and his uh, 35 years of uh, gaming experience. Uh, but the best way to do that is to start talking about that book. Robert, how are you doing today, sir? I'm doing great. How are you? Doing well. Well, sir, uh, what I wanted to know, I, we all see my video on the Majestic Fantasy RPG. And uh, what I want to ask you um, is what is the most obvious change from this, from using any other uh, you know, old school revival product or Dungeons & Dragons in general? I would say it's the uh, presence of my ability system, which is effectively a skill system. I call it abilities because uh, any character can do any ability and there's actually a reasonable chance of uh, uh, being successful at the ability, but uh, it, it's a skill system and it forms a major part of uh, why my system works the way it does compared to uh, a vanilla classic edition. Okay. Now you were talking about that also um, in, in the book that, you know, you, you do have a wide berth. You give characters, if they have the skill, you give them a wide berth to say, look, you just know this stuff. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Can you so, explain a little bit um, why, that you, why you want it to be like that instead of just rolling for it all the time? Well, you know, um, I guess it's because I'm older and I've experienced more and I just, re I seen, you know, um, for example, you know, I have kids and uh, one of them went through scouting. So I got to see young people, uh, different levels of skill development and, and also experiencing myself. And, you know, when you know something, there are things that you know that, you know, you just can do, especially if you're not under stress, like combat or, or time limits. You just, you know, take a time, take a minute to think about it and then you just do it and it works. So I wanted to put some of that in, uh, in um, my campaign. And, uh, you know, part of it was really, uh, really thrown in my face, so to speak, when I did about a decade of live action role playing in the 90s and the early 2000s. And, uh, you know, in live action, um, you know, there, there's a game there, there's game mechanics. But most of what you do, the point of the whole thing is to be there as your character doing stuff. And, you know, there's a lot of things that you just do because you can do it. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to put more of that because in my campaigns, because it, it just gets the players more comfortable that they can try a different thing. They can pursue goals that they want and not worry if this goal compatible with the system or not. Okay. So... Uh, they, instead, they can focus on what it would feel like to be a character in the setting most commonly expressed, like, I want to do this. I want to become a merchant prince. I want to become leader of the Thieves Guild. I want to become a baron. Or sometimes it's just as mundane as I want to build this inn on this crossroads and these undead are not going to stop me. Nice. Now, I can definitely agree with a lot of that because one thing that you know, you uh, have other uh, systems out there, any role playing at all. And, you know, with with combat skills, it's a guarantee that you're going to be able to use them. I mean, yeah, you still got to roll for them. But, you know, when you get one of those, when you when you have to have a character decide between, oh, I want to have this, I can put points into this combat skill and just uh, be, you know, a munchkin, as they say, or you know, put something into role playing. Well, you want the role playing thing to work, otherwise it's a lost cause. You just spent points on nothing. Also, my ability system really focuses on the stuff outside of combat, outside of spell casting. Because when I decide to present my stuff uh, for the classic editions, I, I opted to base my things on uh, swords and wizardry. You know, that was the area that. I needed filled with stuff you do outside of combat. So, you know, and the reason why, you know, a lot of, and, and this works for a lot of campaigns, you just wing it and it happened and players are happy. But over the years, I players like to be better at these things outside the combat, just like they want to be better at combat and better at spellcasting. 
So hence the, the ability system. All right. What do you think is the most nuanced thing that people might miss going over your book or what makes it different? Maybe the lack of alignment. You know, I didn't even, you're right, because I didn't know. You just, you just, you said that and that's like, yeah, you're right. There isn't one. So I have codes. And there, as you notice with the uh, cleric of Deliquane, there's a code that those clerics follow. And when, when I uh, present the other volumes in this series, or if you have my Majestic Waterlands uh, uh, supplement already, you'll see that there are other classes like clerics, like a paladin, like um, uh, a Mariadin of, uh, of set that, uh, you know, they have a definite ethos, code, and belief that they follow. And some of them are not pleasant to experience. So those are one of the usually considered the evil, evil guy, the bad guys. But, you know, and, and then the, the codes that are more about honor, justice, truth, those tend to be viewed as the good guys, but just like life, people are nuanced. So I try to have some of that in, in my campaign because when you focus a campaign on making your mark in the world, you know, the dungeon is fun, you know, going out and exploring the wilderness is fun, but in my campaign, they can become a means to an end. And at some point you have to, once you've accomplished what you did, wanted to do in the dungeon, now what do you do? And I need to define that, hence the nuances and why early on I ditched alignment because it didn't really fit with what I was doing. Okay. And it is a controvert, <clears throat> excuse me, a controversial issue. Um, you know, people like an alignment or not like an alignment. So in other words, though, you put alignment, you kind of put alignment in there only when it's necessary, only yeah. when there's a code. And then everything else is don't worry about it. Just do your like, for example, what alignment is Julius Caesar? Hmm. What alignment is Caliglia? So that's an easier one. <laughs> the, the, you know, so, you know, when you look at these historical figures, which, which when I was a kid, I based a lot of my, uh, you know, ideas out of, uh, out of history that, that, you know, I would redress the situation. And, and that's the challenge my players had to overcome in order to become what they wanted to become. So, and it just, I realized I'm, I don't, I'm not going to worry about what alignment Julius Caesar, I'm just going to role play him like how, you know, that NPC, like how he is and what, what happens, happens. All right. Uh, what is in, or I should say, what is it? Yeah. What is in the $50 books that are out there right now? The main uh, Dungeons and Dragons stuff that you don't think that was necessarily to put in there because I mean this is of course a small book and of course the Dungeons and Dragons uh, OSR revival is all about a little bit of a minimalist uh, going in there um, so what do you think that's you know in there that all those books and stuff that, that you don't necessarily need well I mean the bulk of uh, when you when you're talking about Dungeons and Dragons the bulk of it are the list character classes, uh, character classes, skills, equipment, spells, monsters, you know, and, you know, Dungeon Dragons is a bit of a kitchen sink. So, you know, to keep consistent with prior editions, even the, uh, uh, you know, the earlier ones like AD&D and OD&D, you need to pretty much include everything. With me, you know, I have some ideas about what to include and what not to conclude include and if i don't use it i don't include it so i mean it's not i don't think it's bad it's just most of my work is about the stuff i use and then the nuances i gave it and over the years i uh tended to uh pare down my list uh from what i originally started out when when my system of choice with ad and d for uh, first edition and the, and the thing that and this is interesting so the thing that impressed me about that made this be a thing I should be doing is um, so I bought the monster manual too so now I have three books on my shelf monster manual the, uh, the fiend folio and the monster manual too and there's a lot of choices 
So, and I realized, you know, I want to see what's there. So I came up with categories like humanoid. Um, ab- uh, I didn't call them aberration. That's the reason. But they were like aberration. I called them weird, weirdies or something like that. And, uh, you know, uh, undead. And so I went through each monster and put them in one of this category in the notebook. And then I get, so after I got done, I look at the category that I, I labeled as sentient creatures. There, there are sentient creatures and there are sentient creatures capable of forming cultures. Like they, and that was the list I was really interested in. There were 50 items on that list. Oh, man. So I was like, oh, I'm not going to be able to make a setting that has all 50 of these races forming culture it's just i can't do it justice so that's when i started picking and choosing and i still have the notebook i'll be if it would show up on the video i would be glad to show it but uh (laughs) no worries we got always got uh, other times to show them off but as far as future productions go that comes to my next question uh the book uh talks about levels one through five but yet it explains characters uh, up to level 16. So the question is, I mean, uh, what other books are you planning? There, is, I almost want to assume that there is. Well, I'm going to take a, I'm going to go out on a limb with, with how I'm going to plan the whole line. And the reason for this is how many OSR full systems that are out there, or at least two dozen. Yeah. So I am, you know, and I'm not particularly early with it. I'm rather late with with my with my take so um i had to think you know what am i going to do if i put my book out there it very well might like be be considered yeah that's nice but there's old school essentials which is newer but there's swords and wizardry there's ostrich there's labyrinth lord you know and and lamentations of flame Prince, all old standby wide following so i thought but there's another thing I noticed. It is rare when I talk to people that they stick with a single system in that they will start out with uh, swords and wizardry, but then they will add in other cool stuff. Maybe there's a, an old school essential class they like, and so they built that on top of swords and wizardry. And because all the classic editions, starting with OD&D to uh, AD&D, uh, second edition or a hop and a skip from each other, it's kind of easy to do. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to support that directly. I know there's going to be fans of my system as is, but for every, I want to be everybody else's second choice. I want to be everybody's choice. When it comes to kick bashing, I want them to say, you know, Rob Conley might have something in his line that he can, I can use. So the next book in the series is going to be what I call the Lost Gwemire Magic. And it will have the complete level range of magic users, and it will have the artificer class, which is a ritual only spellcaster. It will have uh, the tree hand, which is um, it's kind of like third edition sorcerer in that they can cast, they don't have to memorize spell and spell slot, but they can only have a limited number of spells they can cast per day. And uh, and I have uh, some other spellcasting uh, rune casters and so forth, and they'll have all the arcane spells in there. It will have magic creation rules, and it will have details on the magical orders, and plus a few uh, subsystems like, um, I'm not going to, I'm trying to go to classic traveler level of detail with this stuff, but if you want to have your own, what I call a conclave of mages, and uh, so they require some place to live, uh, support their laboratory, so I'm going to have a basic system where if you pay so much gold per month, this is what I'm going to take. To, this is how long it will take to build it, and this is how long. This is what you need to spend, earn either through adventuring or dealing with other NPCs. How much you have to earn to keep keep it maintained. Then after that, I'll have books like the Red Skull of War, which is about fighter and combat, uh, the Chromatic Tombs of the Heavens, which is about clerics, and then it's going to be. Uh, uh, a monster manual, which I'm going to call the Legendarium of the Fantastic. And it will just won't have monsters in there. There will be a chapter or two about how I use them in the campaign with some uh, materials you can just use right out of the box, right out of the box, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Uh, one unusual thing I'm going to do is I'm going to have uh, a pair of what I call Domsday Codex after the uh, historical English 
uh, senses. Because the world outside the dungeon plays such a big factor in my campaign, I'm going to have a monster manual, but it's of NPCs. Okay. So the great Domesday Codex is all about the humans. So I'll talk about, you know, you know, here's what feudal life is like. Here's some NPCs that go along with it. This is what life like a mage is like. Here's some NPCs that go along with. Here's what life in a thieves guild is like. Here's some NPCs that go along with that. As well as some, you know, instead of character races, I have backgrounds. So I'm going to supply also backgrounds so character players can take some of these options for themselves. And they're not going to be really rules heavy. They're just going to have the basic race package plus one or two uh, tweaks, like a bonus to an ability or something. And then, but between these two, you'll have a library to flesh out a town, a village, or you know any kind of opposition that not that's normally found within the larger setting, not the dungeon or the wilderness. And uh, you know, and include equipment it's like which I call the role of the strange of the arcane, which I have all the equipment, all the equipment, the magic items and uh, random treasure generation. And then finally, and this is the one that people get on my case about all for the past decade, I'll be writing about uh, what I'm calling some, I haven't quite said on the title, but right now the working title is Axioms of Sandbox Campaigns. So, ah, so that's where I'm gonna that. take my how to make a fantasy sandbox, They'll probably be, be finished for the before then, but I'm going to incorporate that as well as all the other posts and some some ideas I had since then, plus hopefully some aids that will be useful. Together, together that series would be the Majestic Fantasy RPG. Okay. And the thing is, though, even though I have yet to write the books, the rules though are written. So, for example. Most of the stuff is are fine in binders like this, and uh, you know. So when I play, you know, I have, you know, the magic spells. Okay. And this is what you know, all the spells are, right here. Nice. So that brings me to another question. Uh, basically, you know, from pounding your fist down and saying, "I'm going to make this." to actually getting the first print copy done. How long did it take you to get this this uh, in production? I mean, from, from really the first serious set no, notion that you were doing this. Oh, you mean uh, the basic rules? Yeah. Like you're actually saying, oh, let's print it out. Not, not, hey, I've been working on this and this is mine. That's one thing. That's, this is another saying, I'm doing this, making it. Oh, I'm a bit of a pack rack on files. It's interesting that you brought that up. Uh, if you can look a, up in a jiffy. I started in February of 2020 and got it done just before the Kickstarter in August. Oh, that's not bad at all. That's not bad at all. So you'd be able to probably, if you kill on that timeline, that's pretty good. Um, I've just known projects like albatrosses around people's necks and they just take forever. So that's, that's a good time frame. Um, well, if I stick with the rules, then I should be able to bang it out. I do want to flesh it out a bit uh, with some supplemental material, like a chapter or two per book. So it's a little bit more than just a, I guess a splat book is, is the derogatory term for it, but uh, a little of the flavor of the majestic fantasy realms. And, uh, uh, but yeah, I think I'll be able to, to get, I think I'll be able to do four projects a year at a very steady clip. So I'm looking at somewhere late 2022 when I get the final ones done. All right, great. Now, when it comes to um, DMs, I mean, could you give a lot of great advice here for, for what would be newbies and stuff and probably even intermediate DMs, but what do you think is the, one thing that most new game masters or even intermediate game masters struggle with the most. They're overwhelmed. I mean, in theory, uh, let me start off with one bit of background. So in one way, one way to view tabletop role playing is it's a pen and paper virtual reality created before we even called it virtual reality. It was that you can't, you know, Aaron, Dave Anderson figured out a way and Guy Gack helped along with that. You know, they, they together, they came out a way to tell, tell people how you can, you know, think of a world in your, in your mind 
people can make up or play themselves for that matter, can make up characters or the play themselves and adventure in that world and come away feeling like, wow, I visited this fantastic place and had a lot of fun. And, uh, but it's a world. So it can be overwhelming. What do I pick and choose from it? And that's why it's important to have something that's uh, focused, doesn't overwhelm you with the scope. And uh, to be honest, you know, the dungeon, it fits the bill almost perfectly because it's not hard to describe. You know, if you want to make a dungeon and run your, your friends through it, you take a piece of graph paper, you draw a maze with rooms on it, and in some of the rooms you put monsters, and some of the rooms, some of the monsters you give treasure, and some of the other rooms you put traps, and the other rooms you, you put treasure all by itself, either it's hidden or sitting on the open, and the rest you leave, read, leave empty, and then you tell your players they're at the top of the flight of the stairs. You walk down, what do you do? And that, that, they hit that one right off the bat. And it's just a great way to get a novice uh, referee um, going. Now, what I hope to do, especially when I get into the axioms of Sandbox Campaign, is figure something just as straightforward, but where it's what I call a sandbox adventure. And uh, it's a little bit more tricky. It might be something that be intermediate level uh, at, the, at the end of the day, but I'm going to give my best stab at it. Okay. Um, now that brings me uh, again to another question. Uh, basically, you talking about your sandbox campaigns. Um, you know, how do you how do you get a storyline going with a sandbox campaign? Most people are familiar nowadays with a very linear campaign. You know, A to B to C. You're here at the end. No matter what happens, it's A to B, A to B to D. Boom, boom, boom. You know. But for a sandbox campaign, open gaming. Um, how do you get a complete storyline? How do you have to tailor this, the characters to say, look, we're going to move your storyline in manageable ways that really fit the open area? Or can you do something that's more, uh, well, I, guess, I, I, mean, that, I mean, otherwise, I, my thought is something with an open campaign, you can't guarantee anything. So yeah. how, how, how do you do that? All right, let's see the best way of answering that. Maybe, well, like maybe with his actual play. So you personally, right now, mm -hmm. you role played for a decades by this point, right? Yeah. Is there any particular? Let's just stick with the bog standard D and D. Is there anything about D and D, the setting that's behind it and the classes, that you haven't really explored, but you like to pretend to be a character? Hmm. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, that's... Or, yeah. or, or a fantasy. It's some, you, you read a book, watch a movie, and you thought, you know, I, I want to be that. See what life is like at that character. Anything that leaps to mind right now for you? Um, just uh, let me see here. One comes right out of my mind. I might, I just crawl. I, you know, my, favorite, my favorite movie back in the 80s, it crawl. Crawl, okay. Yeah. I, I'm not too familiar, so you'll have to bear with me. That's but if right. I remember correctly... Crow is uh, swords and sorcery, right? Yeah, it was definitely swords and sorcery. Okay, so would you uh, would would you consider Crawl a barbarian? No, not at all. It's just a. But what's Crawl's background then? Uh, there was basically a a, a, um, a Corwin was a guy he had. He was that with that glaive weapon and stuff. It was all about hunting the the magical weapon to, to slay the beast. Is really what it comes down to. And sure, but well, where did where did uh, Corwin come from? Oh, he was he was a uh, just a prince uh, prince of the castle, basically. Um, that's that's pretty much it. He had the princess, the whole nine yards on the bait. So let me guess. So let me guess, because uh, I really don't remember the movie. So he was a prince of a realm, and the realm was attacked by the bad guy, wrecked everything he knows holds dear. Yeah, and uh, then now he has to be the hero. And of course, the glaive was the weapon, if I remember correctly, the weapon that gave him the power to to right the wrong and defeat the bad guy. Am I correct? That's about right. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So what I would do, given that interest, we wouldn't reenact crawl, crawl, 
But we would look at the bigger level picture and say, do you want to be a prince? Okay, let's make a noble character. And uh, I would make up the bad guy. I wouldn't tell you who it is because part of, if I remember correctly, and I definitely know other movies of similar genre, they never see it coming. Right. Okay. So what I would do is I would uh, create your family with you. We would describe your family. And it might wind up being like Corwin's family. It might be something completely original that you're, 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 we're just throwing in stuff from all over the place. But the campaign would start out with you as a prince in this prince. And then there would be uh, something that happened because there's this bad guy with his own plan, with his own goals. And unfortunately for your character, you don't know about him at that point of time. So you have to suffer whatever happened. And I would like to play, I would probably say, let's play this out and see what happens, even though it's a little predestined, yeah. you know. Um, but after that point, so now you are aware of this bad guy, okay? Now that you uh, saw your family get slaughtered and know who survived and what's left, I would say, what do you do at that point? Okay. And that's it. You just go for I, it. I, I, you, you would have to look at yourself, think, my character is a print. Everything's wrecked. I know this bad guy. I, I, you looked at this one sheet of paper I gave you about what your kingdom was like. And then you might decide, well, let's see. There's a druid here. I know there's this wizard in this wood. Uh, there's this town here. I know this town is wrecked, though. And then you would just weigh your choice. And I wouldn't know what choice you made. Right. I would have a, a notebook or, or printout that just have some sketches and I would just see what you do. And then uh, generally I have enough material for a couple of sessions, you know, because in a campaign, you're not going to, you're only going to travel so far. So I only have to define a certain area. I don't have to worry about the rest of the world until you reach that part. So if if it looks like you're you're heading way off, then of course you know that week I'm going to have a little bit of extra work to do. Yeah. And, I guess uh, that's maybe why they made uh, spells that like gate and stuff like at really high level, so you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> maybe, <laughs> but I hope that makes sense as an illustration of what there isn't a story. They're just this bad guy with this plan. And as your character do things or not do things, that bad guy's plan will change. So I have this, at the start of the campaign, I'll have a plan. This guy got, will have a plan. He's going to think he's going to have to take out this, this, recruit that person, uh, kill that person, uh, obtain this item. Mm -hmm. And it starts off with killing your family. But from then on out, you may foil many parts of his plan. Like, Maybe he wants to kill um, the wizard, but you get to the wizard first and inadvertently, you may not even know it, but because you engage that wizard and because that wizard, you got that wizard to grow, go along, agree to go along with you to help you with something, he's no longer there to be killed. Now the bad guy has to change his plan. So what I do after every session, I look at my list of what all the NPCs plan, both good and bad, and see what I have to change because of what you did or in most cases, what the group did. Okay, and that's a lot, it's definitely a lot more challenging, I would think, than doing a linear campaign, because a linear, it's just like, okay, I gotta get them here, you get them here, you gotta shoehorn them in to get to the next area, and then get to the end, it's kind of got a, a lot more creativity doing it uh, the way you're describing it. Yeah, you know, you know the, the creativity in the sandbox really comes uh, from not so much preparing things out to the end but really okay you start off the beginning you have this place and it has this life people have characters were living their lives before your character dropped in so there's one part of where creativity then after it starts in some sense it runs on autopilot so to speak but because people are people and People are nuanced, people make decisions. Now you have to say, well, he took that wizard away from the fort. The bad guy was expecting him there to be there to be killed. What's the bad guy going to do? 
I may randomly roll, or it may be obvious what he does. So he might say, screw it, I'm going to go on to the next thing I got to do. Or he may say, I got to find that wizard. I got to know what happened to him and kill him. So the next session, all of a sudden, you feel you're being targeted by assassins, and you're not sure why. And why? And then you, you know, that leads to why are he sending the? Why is this wizard so important? And that might lead to a, a whole phase of the campaign where you're trying to figure out this mystery, and that may prove a key piece later on of re, you know getting vengeance for your family and beating the bad guy. Nice. All right. Uh, got a couple of quick questions for you. Uh, when should a character retire on average? When do you think? Whenever they feel like it. Okay. Uh, when should a campaign retire? Is that different than when a character retires? A uh, campaign, like a whole group or maybe a storyline, for instance. Like, I mean, I've heard of campaigns that last decades and such well um my setting has lasted decades i had multiple campaigns so when one of those what i call a campaign ends, it's because the group wants it it becomes a natural start ending point sometimes it, it peters out and uh you know we just real life takes over and we just can't meet any boy more i had that happen but sometimes it ends really unexpectedly short because the players look at each other. I look at the players. You said, you know what? There's no reason why they should adventure anymore. You have achieved your goals. Right. Okay. Uh, do you think the uh, amount of uh, gamers is relative to the amount of snowfall in an area? <laughs> I don't know. I lived north all my life. I can't really say one way or the other. Uh, I would, I, I've, uh, I, I don't know. It's a theory with me. I'm, I'm away from the snow in Washington here. Um, but there's a lot of gaming here too. I mean, Washington of all places, you know, is the place of Wizards of the Coast out here. So it's tons of gaming, but I just feel like people have always been inside. It's just like, that's the guy find something to do. Um, well, I think there's a lot of founders effect. So, you know, it sometimes it just takes one person and all of a sudden that sets up gaming for, for the next couple of decades in an area. Yeah. Well, like Steve Jackson, maybe in uh, Texas, right? Yeah, like in Austin, Texas. Yeah, no doubt. Um, now, what's your, uh, what's your, pre I mean, pre maybe as a, do you, do you play still or do you just DM mainly? Actually, I'm, these days I'm playing more than I'm refereeing, but uh, mostly because uh, with uh, virtual tabletop, it's a lot easier to get together with people, even though we're separated all over the place. And especially with, you know, we didn't really have a choice last year with the co with this year with COVID. So um, right now I am refereeing two campaigns and playing one. But if you asked me that last quarter, I was playing three campaigns. So. Oh, wow. That's a, uh, how, how long is a session usually for you nowadays? I mean, is it, what, what, what do you consider a normal session? Normal. Well, I consider normal four hours or so, but these days we're doing it in the evening. So we're we're lucky to get two or three hours in. Okay. We start around seven, end up about ten o'clock. Right. Uh, now, is this more like bowling night where you have like four or five people around and it's every week, or do you have campaigns that have a cast of characters like they just pop in and out, and you have you have a campaign but it's rolling like with people coming in and out? No, this uh, all all the campaigns that involve are pretty much uh, tight knit groups of friends. Okay. All right, and uh, what ge what games do you play when you're not role playing? Um, uh, computer games like uh, Kerbal Space Program, uh, War Games, uh, Stellaris, Hearts of Iron. I I'm a total sucker for. <laughs> I'm a total sucker for sandbox computer games. There you go. Which is why the whole term got coined in the first place, which was. We were a bunch of us in the mid 2000s were working with Necromancer Games and a bunch of old time uh, Judges Guild referee were recruited by Bob Bledsaw II. And he turned us over to Clark Peterson and uh, Necromancer Games. And Clark gave us each of us a chapter or two or a section or two of uh, to do of that box set. And after it was done, 
you know, it was $70, which is a big ask, mm -hmm. especially for something that was different to the audience of the 2000 that the Waterlands of High Fantasy was. And so we decided, we had to, we talked among ourselves and somebody said, well, why don't we call what we do as a sandbox? You know, it's like those computer games, everybody, it's like civilization. There's no set end. There's nobody telling you what to do. We just start out in a village and they can go wherever. And it says, you know what? And I said, that's good. That's cool. Let's start using that. And we all started using that. Nice. Well, you know, I had to ask a, a Columbia Games Harn question in here sooner or later. What's your favorite Harn kingdom and why? Well, all the whole damn thing's my favorite. <laughs> That's a good answer. <laughs> but uh, uh, I, truth to be told, I have run most of my campaigns in. Uh, Kande or um, Kaldor. Right on. Okay. Well, uh, you know, uh, Raba, is there uh, basically you can get this uh, the Majestic Fantasy RPG. You can get it at Drive Through RPG, right? Right. Uh, where else can you get this at? Can you get it direct from Batney Attic or? No, just Drive Through for now. Just drive through for now. Okay. Well, de definitely uh, a lot to look in. I'm sure everybody's going to. Uh, want to pick this up and this is the majestic uh, fantasy rpg and the, we have uh, robert s Conley here robert thank you very much for the interview thank you